Um, she is also a model. Uh, she's one of our speakers, so let's just give her a little. Yeah, sure. Um, hey guys, how are you guys doing? Um, so I'm excited to be here. Basically, my journey as a model um, was kind of something that I fell into. I wasn't, it wasn't something that I guess I necessarily thought I would want to pursue. Um, I decided to go into it in 2014 when I saw a casting call online. Um, I was bullied basically all my life. So um, being called ugly, being called, oh, you're just so strange, you look like a male, um, say my nose is too broad, my complexion is too dark, my hair is too kinky. And to actually get to the point where I was able to submit to a casting call and be accepted and moving forward, even though I didn't place in the competition because they were looking for the face of African fashion week. And um, even though I didn't place in the competition, that sparked the flame and the fire to keep going and to move forward on this journey. And it's just been spiraling forward and where I feel more confident in who I am and be accepting of just the uniqueness because I really feel like everyone is designed for greatness and everyone is made beautiful no matter of what complexion or skin color or hair texture and size or anything like that. So I really represent, I want to represent diversity because I really feel like every person in this room is entitled to feel and be accepted as who they are. So, yeah. Okay, so this is going to be a discussion or speaking about diversity and this the platform diversity. So let's go on to some of yeah. Diversity. Um, there can be such a negative and positive to that word, just in terms of the sense that obviously within the fashion industry, you want to move, you want to move towards having diversity and seeing um, designers of color, models of color and across the spectrum. But sometimes when it comes to like the business side of it, you can also see diversity as like a tool, right? And I think in today's world, diversity can, needs to be used and looked at as something that just needs to be encompassed in the fashion industry and not looked at as like, well, in order to garner more sales, we're going to be diverse, otherwise we're going to lose our following, right? <laughs> um, and so I think what we're moving, like what the industry is moving towards is that fine line between um, diversity for a purpose of making sure that people of all colors see themselves in an ad and then therefore feel comfortable in purchasing a product because they're represented versus just being like we are putting um, an Asian model in this ad in order to therefore just sell a product. Um, so I think that is um, something to always keep in the back of our minds when we're talking about <coughs> diversity. Um, in regards to myself, um, my modeling career has been kind of very on and off. I still consider myself like an up and coming model, if anything. Um, but when I started off, um, it was it was rock it was rocky, of course, just because oftentimes I would either be the only black model at these, some of these very small boutique fashion shows. Um, the makeup artist would not know um, how to do my makeup in terms of having the right products for my skin tone, and. Um, I, I remember going looking back, and one of my experiences was that I did a fashion show at Ryerson, and at the time, the makeup artists on set were, or at the fashion show, were from Avita, and uh, they had done everybody else's makeup and then got to me, and um, they were like, oh, well, we don't really have any foundation for your complexion, but you have really beautiful skin anyway, so we'll just like do a little touch up here and there and like send you on your way. And then in addition to that, the um, hair, um, and styling people. I had a weave in, very similar to one that I'm wearing right now. And I had bangs, and I guess they wanted to go for like this like sleek, just kind of like risen out of the water look, and had decided to like flip up my bangs. And then so you could like see the, my like my natural hair underneath, which is like not the point of a weave. Like it was supposed to, it was a new style, right? Um, and so it just made me extremely uncomfortable. And so I think part of diversity is not just in the models that you're casting. My point being is that you need to have diversity in your makeup artist and your hairstylist and to make sure that they know the um, history behind the people that they're working with and know that you know you could get um, a black girl with really kinky hair coming into your set, you could get um, an Asian girl with really straight hair, and you need to know how to work with these people, not just because um, not just because they are of a different race, but because they're people who deserve your best work, right? Um, and your best work should be encompassing, being able to work with all different types of people. Yeah. 
So I think that's my guess. Uh, so basically just going back to what Zoe was saying. Um, so there's a lot of times where I would go into like different malls and stuff and I would see like in certain stores like there's like a certain race um, you know on a brand or a certain person on a certain brand and sometimes I'm just kind of sitting down and looking like how come there's only one person that's like you know uh, representing that brand or representing that certain thing that's going on and I just feel like when I look at them I'm like well if you guys had a bunch of braces actually connecting to your brand a lot more people would actually be involved and actually a lot more people would actually like buy your product um, in terms of that, I feel like, yes, it's about, like, obviously there's a sale portion to it, and I guess that's why people do that, but at the same time, again, you have to really have everyone included and everyone involved so that they see that, like, you know, oh, man, like, I didn't know that my certain race, um, you know, does this type of brand, or I didn't know my certain race does this type of brand, so I feel like in that way, it makes everyone involved, it makes everyone included, which I really like. Um, so that's why I think diversity um, really, really means just really just having everybody involved and everyone included. And me being a stylist, so a lot of the time, a lot of stylists, if you guys know, they only style one certain thing. So they'll be like, oh, I only style skinny people. Oh, I only style dark skins. Oh, I only style this. They don't have a, a, a thing where they style everybody. And I feel like as a stylist, that's what I um, represent. I represent everybody. And um, it doesn't matter like what race you are. It doesn't matter um, how much you weigh. You can be plus size. You can be skinny. It doesn't matter. My job is to make you feel comfortable in the way you look. And I feel like a lot of stylists lack that. They don't have the ability to really just put everybody on board and have everybody involved. They just have a certain thing that they want to style, and like that's it. But regardless, when you in the future you're gonna work with people you haven't worked with before, so you have to make sure that you really have yourself accountable for everybody that you um, basically style or even when it comes to modeling, even when I'm running a business, just like what Aaron was saying, like, you know, everybody wants their own thing. So imagine if, you know, a person came to me and I'm styling them and they're like, well, I don't want that. And I'm like, well, I don't do that. It's like, how does that, you know, differentiate between the business and diversity, you know? So just having everybody involved and having everybody included as um, what your brand represents what you do and that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so definitely, like, even, I feel like we should target, like, the CEOs of, like, the companies that um, produce, like, even makeup artists and stuff like that, and people who do the campaigns. I feel like we have to target those, that hierarchy in order for there to be really change, because it's the hierarchy that makes the decisions implementing how we see and see these images so because they're the ones that select the models for the campaign they're the ones that select the makeup artists etc etc so even at the um for instance like aveda she, as you had mentioned um aveda maybe they're not trained on how to make or do the makeup for dark skin or asian or you know east east asian like you know they need to be trained in all aspects of diversity in order to make sure that the models don't feel uncomfortable in the rooms because there are times where I do get that. I do get, oh my gosh, okay, your hair is an afro. I'm supposed to leave it at that. I'm like, what do you mean? You can't, you can't pin it to the side. There's like so much you can do to natural textured hair. Even like the Asian hair, sometimes we just leave it alone. If they're like, oh, it's too straight, that we can't curl it. Oh, you know, come on. Like, there's so much you can do to all types of, of demographics. Like, we have to be able to, I guess, make an alarm or build a campaign where the different CEOs pick up on this and cause that shift to happen. So, yeah. Excellent. I definitely agree with everything that's been said. It's something that really needs to be attacked from the top rather than just starting with the people down below because you can't get rid of a problem without cutting it from the root. You know what I mean? So, excellent, guys. Um, <clears throat> can we speak about, I know you guys kind of spoke about it a bit, you speak about some tactics or ways that we can progress and have like an actual formula that we can progress in the fashion industry. I would definitely say like the campaign thing. Like I feel like if people um, think of a vision of how we can implement diversity, especially since this is about diversity, you know, drawing different models of different different looks, like red hair, freckles, you know thicker, fuller, curvier women, people who have high stature, even doesn't have to be the, the hourglass perfect, you know. I want people of all demographics to really just be represented so that the millennials of today, when they look up, they're like, okay, that person looks like me. Oh, okay, she has kinky wild hair or super short, spiky hair, pixie hair, you know, like androgynous, everything. I want people to just feel 
accepted and feel loved. And that's what it comes down to. We have to feel loved. And if we don't feel loved, how are we able to embrace each other? How are we able to express, okay, maybe because she looks different, I'm not able to show that love to her. We have to be able to see the differences, but at the same time, accept each other. Right. So, yeah. Yes. I think from a corporate standpoint, um, also, um, I'm not sure if people are aware of, about that h and scandal mm -hmm. where a young black model, a little boy, he had the, a sweater that said, cool, it's a monkey in the jungle. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the repercussions from that were that a lot of the par partnerships with high um, with high profile celebrities like Billy Gatton and G E Z were scratched because these people did not want to be associated with H&M anymore due to their racist ad. And um, they're moving forward. H&M decided to hire a diversity leader, um, I guess, to handle and to make sure that ads like that don't even make it to like the cutting board where you present that to a team and then somebody decides, oh yeah, like that seems like a cool idea. Because if you think about the process of, an, of how an ad gets published, it has to go through a team of people. And so that means a team of people decided that that ad was appropriate to go out on a national and international scale. So I think the tactic of hiring a diversity leader hopefully will work to their advantage and that that person will be educated enough to pass on information to the team at H&M to ensure that something like that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And hopefully other companies will kind of follow suit um, in their own unique way, whether it's hiring a diversity leader or hiring somebody with experience and making sure that people of color are represented behind the scenes also on the forefront. I'm really happy you brought up the H&M scandal. That was actually another question that we had for all of you. Um, so as Zoe said, um, just about the H&M scandal and what had happened and just the background on that, um, what are your views on that whole situation in general and how do you think it could have been avoided? Uh, just going back into what Zoe was saying, like, again, um, an ad goes through a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a bunch of people sat at the table and said that this was okay. You know what I mean? And I feel like for me, yes, I was um, enraged just because I feel like this was cool, like monkey in the jungle, like monkeys. This is what we were called during slavery. Like this is what we were called. So for people to sit down and say like, well, I don't know why you guys are offended. It's because you're not going back to the history. You're not going back to the root. Like this is what we were called. This is what people used to uh, use against us as a derogatory word. So when I heard, when I seen coolest monkey in the jungle, I'm like, Okay, you know, and I was really, again, going back to, so which person, like, let this go through? Like, which person said this was okay to let it go through? And then what even enraged me more was when the mom said, well, it's, it, it's okay, like, you know, it, it's all right. And I'm just kind of figuring out, like, why do we have to really, like, sell ourselves just for a dollar? You know what I mean? Like, why, why do we have to do that? Because, you know, I guess, you know, obviously a lot of families are struggling with this, that, but it's like, we never have to sell ourselves that low for us to go through that. And you know, and I don't want this little boy to grow up and think that being called a monkey is okay. Mm -hmm. Because again, in our generation, like that wasn't that wasn't a good word. That was a derogatory word. So he's gonna grow up and think like the who is monkey in the jungle is like so dope. And really it's not. So that was my really thoughts on that. And it's kinda like again, hire somebody who kinda like knows what's right and what's wrong. Like the experience wise, hire a diversity leader to understand and let them know like this is this is not okay. Because for it to go through all those people and then for them to, you know, publish that, it's like, wow, you know? And um, it's even to the point where I was seeing that a lot of people were trashing H&M stores. So for me, I don't agree with that. But at the same time, it's like, like, do, like, do we have to go that extent for us to get the like, attention? Like, do we have to trash these stores? Do we have to do these things so that we're heard? Like, why do we have to go that far? For us for like for us to like you know be heard and i feel like that again is just something that needs to be really just um thought about and just really trained about and that was my situation on that it's like so yeah hi uh, hi okay so this is another one of our speakers Emanuela Ocon. Um, um so just going off what Jalen said, um, it's just the message that was brought out to the public and the idea of that something like this is okay for it to have gone through so many different people and have it out there. So what do you guys think, having like a message like that and that strong, what type of impact do you think it had on younger children and just other individuals that are looking to be in the fashion industry and just children in general? 
looking up to campaigns like that? I feel like um, actually considering it's because so much of what happens in the U.S. still really impacts the rest of the world globally. I think if you kind of zoom out and look at the climate in the United States right now, it's becoming so um, just so reactionary where we are looking at so much like just like bullshit that's happening on so many different levels of their government, especially, but also like in those higher level positions. Um, our, our age group, we're just, we, we don't, like, everything is political now. So if, we, if you see something that doesn't resonate with you or that you think is hateful or that you think is racist, we now have responsibility to call it out, and we have the power to do so with our voices. And I think what we're seeing now is, is that change is coming, and I think it's an inevitable change that will come when our age begins to mature and we begin to start having a position with more power and more responsibility. Unfortunately, I do feel like people like Donald Trump and like just like Jeff Sessions and all these people in the government who keep getting fired every day um, are, are kind of like it isn't our responsibility to try to make them see better. I think they are <coughs> racist and I think they do have um, views that we just probably can make unbake out of them. But what we can do is try to make sure that going forward when we have the option, we put diversity, true diversity and understanding in every single pillar of an institution. Be that be in H&M, um, that the image with the um, coolest monkey in the jungle, um, it was actually, I think, an e-commerce image. So it was taken from like an online website. And I paid for my education doing e-commerce for large brands like Nordstrom's and Saks. And um, on set, normally, you'd have about five people. You'd have like a makeup artist, hairstylist. You'd have the art director, whose job is literally just to do that, to look at an image and go, this is OK, the photographer, et cetera. We all have the chance to voice our opinions. We all have the chance to say that that's not OK. I think what you were seeing there is um, a lot of brands have been trying to cut costs quite a bit in e-commerce. And so you'd only have maybe the model and the photographer on set. Not only is that not safe for the models, as you heard, everything happening in you too, it's all very real, but it also allows for things to not be checked and to go unseen. You saw that with Dove and their Facebook ad where it was like the before and after oh, yes. photo. Like someone just edited that and threw it up on Facebook and nobody had a chance to say, that's disgusting, that's like absolutely racist, like we cannot be promoting that, especially when Dove is a pioneer in body positivity and diversity itself. Um, I think it's just really important that people check themselves, especially if they're older and they don't get it. Like if they're older, if they're white, and they just haven't lived a life where they're exposed to, to race and racism, um, it's kind of, they should probably step back and give someone else the right to actually make this. Absolutely. Can we um, take a comment from our social media platform? Yeah. So because we're on live on Instagram, we actually have a participant uh, want to make a comment on what we just touched on. So uh, Renee Muir, she said, very true. Big brand names truly need to realize the impact of their ads with having such a big platform. Though these mistakes shouldn't happen. If they do, it should be acknowledged and make sure going forward, these things don't happen again. Um, she's also said, appreciate this awareness that, um, that is raising um, much much appreciated and respect to those speaking. Um, so just to follow up what you guys were saying, I feel like really it's just about deconstructing like what we were taught in our minds and trying to just go back those steps and start from the beginning and then work our way out. Because if we look at campaigns and ads like that, we consistently say, okay, yeah, you know, it's okay, let's let it slide and we can handle. That's us basically saying, you know, it's okay, we can do it moving forward and we'll just let it continuously be handled by someone else. And then if we all have that mindset, things are really going to be handled by everyone else. Um, let's introduce Emanuela Ocon. Um, she's also a fashion blogger and a YouTuber. Um, she's been with speakers, especially traffic held her up a little bit. But um, do you want to just say a couple words about yourself? Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Emanuela Ocon. Um, I am from Nigeria, but I'm, I currently live in Canada. Um, I'm 18 years old. Um, I'm a fashion YouTuber and style blogger. Um, I'm currently at IUTM. I'm taking CCIT, so Communication, Culture, and Information Technology, and Political Science. So I'm majoring in those two, IUTM. And 
Yeah, I just wanted to add to what she said. Absolutely. Yeah, so I feel like also like companies, they don't, like they might try to like um, touch on this issue of diversity, but I feel they don't do it the right way. Right. So that's why there's like a misrepresentation of how it's like portrayed in the society. Because they know about the issue, right? But like they don't know how to like voice it out to the public. So it's kind of mixed up. But I also feel like. I also feel that this is just my personal like because if it's some other brand, you might not really like react that way, right? So, so it's each of them. had such a large following and mm-hmm. a huge impact. Yeah. Exactly. Um, do you guys have any other thoughts that you'd like to share on that topic? Or sometimes I think like they do it intentionally. Like, mm-hmm. we, like I feel like it was like strategized. Like mm-hmm. also like may not necessarily be that way, but it, like, I feel like it was strategized to the point because they consider us like, you know, black, like a black minority, mm-hmm. and um, they could play on that. So they go, hey, you know, let's put this little boy like our monkey suit, you know, and see how they react. And maybe they weren't expecting that reaction, but it, it turned into that reaction, so now driving more attention to them, whether it was negative or positive, but now we're still talking about them, regardless of the situation. So, um, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a play in perspective. Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to our next topic, and that is self love. So I know that all of you in the fashion industry have had your ins and outs with uh, that concept in general. So we'd love to hear just your experience with self love and just how you approach that. So uh, let's start with the Okay, so for my blogging and YouTube journey, I actually started my blogging for my YouTube because um, I actually I did not start like immediately so I started in 2016. Like I felt that was when I started like taking my Instagram serious and actually putting out quality content. So I felt like as as like as I was moving on. I felt like I also needed like a YouTube, so another like platform to expand my craft and like put it out into the world. And I also figured that I love like editing videos, so why not like transform like taking pictures into like videos? Because I felt like people have different like different like, interests and stuff. So some people might like to see videos and pictures. And stuff. I also feel like this journey has also helped me in terms of like my self-esteem, my confidence, and just knowing that um, I like I have talent, like I have passions and nothing should stop me from doing what I want to do. So con- like, continuously like putting out content, even when I don't put out co- put out content, I always think about it. I'm like, oh okay, I have something to do and I have to just do it because this is what I love doing. And even you can't tell me like there's no one in this world at least that will not support what you're doing because just know that the amount of like support you get is more than the hate so you should not really think much about the hate and just think about like positive positive vibes and just just think about yourself just hype yourself up be your biggest supporter if you continue to think that way then anytime you like see negative comments or anything you just don't really react. You expect it, right? Because actually, if you're putting yourself out there like this, you should expect comments like this and stuff like that. But it's good to not always think about the negative side. Because before I started doing this, I was that kind of person that um, any little thing, I would just take it like, oh, they hate me. <laughs> so I'm like, no, don't think about that. Just think about the good you're, the good you're bringing into the world. And, the kind of people you impact because definitely you're impacting someone's life with the kind of content you're create, creating. You might not know, but you'll be amazed about how people will just message you and be like, oh, they like what you're doing, you should keep it up. Those kind of things will motivate you. So even if let's say you get like a negative comment after that, you won't think about the negative comment. You just be focused on the good side of it. Yeah. Um, definitely this industry has pulled me out of my comfort zone. I used to be so afraid of like even sitting in front of audiences like in elementary school. Um, I'll take my student, like, yeah, I'll go do your presentation. I'd be like, um, no, 
because I'm too shy, I'm too scared, like I'm, I'm in my little shell, but now I'm actually like able to be okay and just talk to everyone because like we're human beings, we're able to to relate to each other, we all have stories. And the more we put away that guard, the more we're able to be ourselves and just break away free from that, you know, that, that past, then we can really just become the person that we're supposed to be. I used to be afraid of everyone, I used to be shy, I, I used to even battle with just suicide ideations because um, I just heard name calling profusely as a child. But being in this industry actually took me away from those thoughts and just actually being able to accept myself. When I first did my first photo shoot in 2014, I was looking at the picture and I was like, who is that? Like, it didn't look like me. But as time went on and um, I was trying to figure out my identity and my purpose and see why I was even placed here on earth. Um, I guess that's my first time where I was questioning my existence and all that stuff. So that was where I met God. And when I met God, that's when I started to like, I guess read the Bible and read the Bible um, allowed me to see my identity. And there was this one particular scripture where it says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made and marvelous are thy works. And what does that mean in particular? It means that we're designed for greatness. We're made for a purpose. We're made for something that is larger than ourselves. So um, when I began to understand that perspective, I could look in the mirror now and not be afraid of my reflection. I used to cry myself to sleep on countless times of occasion. I remember my mom asking where I am and I'm in my room shutting myself out and I'd just be on my bed crying, 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 hating my existence, all that stuff. And um, I no longer suffer with suicide. I no longer suffer with depression. I no longer suffer with all the anxieties. I, I'm able to just sit here and like look at you beautiful faces and be able to just accept who I am and at the same time I want to encourage you guys to know how beautiful and wonderful you guys are because each one of you have greatness and just want you to explore that. So yeah. It's hard to uh, to follow up with that. But I think in general, um, everybody has their moments, right? You know, whether it's you know feeling down, whether it's because like with you guys right now, exam season or with you know struggling to figure out what you want to do or who you want to be in the future or everything. Um, so crazy story was that, you know, I wouldn't have been where I am today if I wasn't fired from my previous job. So it was at a time where I was working for this company, for Harry Rosen for three years. And um, what happened was, you know, at the end of the day, that a company that big is all about numbers. So, you know, at the time where, you know, they get you when you're down, you know, when your sales are lower, you know, when it's a, it's a rough season and they need to cut costs, that's the time where they're like, okay, look, you need to be pushing harder. You need to be selling more. You need to be doing more things where you can bring in your clients. Um, and from there, it was like, well, listen, you know, they sat me down and said, look, if you don't pull up your numbers, we can't have you anymore, right? Um, and, you know, from there, I was thinking, you know, after I was let go, I was like, you know what, damn, is it really because of the fact that I wasn't good at my job? Did I not know enough about pulling or did I not do enough to help clients out? Um, you know, and it's all about getting through that, right? And 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 sort of pulling yourself up and saying, look, like you were saying, hyping yourself up. Right? Mm -hmm. So from there, it's like, you know, listen, you guys all are are creators, right? Whether it's through content, whether it's through you know building who you are as a person, what you can offer to the world, right? So I think to never forget that and to always you know sort of remember who you are and why you're doing, why you go through your daily life. I think that's the biggest uh, part of self love. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So um, when I first started modeling, um, I was signed with Four Worldwide. So I lived in New York for several years. And I remember on January the 8th, 2013, um, I walked into my agency in New York. And the first thing the agent said to me uh, was she looked at me and she said, you're disgusting. Do you drink butter for water? And um, I was just kind of, I mean, up until that point, I had never, I fortunately, Never really let much of what people said get to me, and I really loved myself. And I was really confident in my skin, and I just believed that I was unique. That was an asset. And uh, so from then, uh, she pulled my pants down in front of the office and measured my hips, and they were um, like a, probably like an extra small or small um, at the time. And she said, um, she, she just was like, I don't know what's happened to you, but you'll never work at this size. And they wanted me to lose 10 pounds in a week, which is like two inches off of my hips. And I remember just apologizing and I started to kind of like well up inside. 
Um, and I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, okay. I remember I called my parents and I was like, I'm gonna have to, they, they told me not to eat for the week and they told me that I should do hot yoga every single day and not eat any fats or nuts or anything that my body wanted, obviously. Um, and I said, okay, because I really wanted to be taken seriously and I really wanted to be in the industry. Um, and that is something that uh, I think the moment that you allow other people to dictate, you know, what works for you and sorry, is everything okay? Uh, what works for you uh, or how you should live, um, that's the moment where you kind of deny the, the idea that you deserve to be loved. And so going forward, obviously, I won't get into everything else, but I mean, I learned a lot from those lessons. Um, listening to other people and making sure that my, I diluted myself and made myself physically smaller um, allowed me to get into the industry and allowed me to do Couture Week in Paris and to live in Paris for a year and to do all the fashion weeks, but it killed me. And I ended up having to retire at 19 and move back to Toronto because my body was like dying from the inside out. Like truly, it was really, really bad. Um, and I hated myself. I would look, I would never look up. I would always look down. I would apologize. It's the first word that came out of my mouth when I was meeting people. And I thought I was a monster because I let people's words get to me. Um, but then this literally was the reason why I am where I am now. And it's why I have so much empathy for people and their stories and why I've built a business that is based around letting young girls never have to feel what I felt. And it's brought me so much joy and I would do it all over again. And I just, I know everybody has a story like that as well. It literally isn't me. You don't have to be a model to be told these things. You don't have to, there, there's just no qualification in a world where we're meant to just kind of be pushed into the small box. It's so not true and so not necessary. And so I think uh, what all these young people are doing, like what I see everybody doing here is just encouraging the fact that uh, diversity is truly our biggest strength. It's in that it's, we are all different. So to try to not, Acknowledge that it's like a waste of time. And being here every day is a gift. And we should all take that and run with it and live our lives. And uh, I mean, through the pain, I've like become very happy with myself. And I don't give a shit about what anybody else has to say. So self love. <laughs> <laughs> um, self love. Wow. <laughs> okay, big, big thing. Um, I guess in regards to self love, and like modeling, um, there was a time when like when I just sort of started getting into this idea of modeling. I I never wanted to be a model. Like I was just a dance school, whatever. And it was actually um, Elmer Olson. I had a career day in high school who was present at my school and came up to me when I was like 13. And was like, are you gonna grow? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, well, if you do, like here's my card, come to me in like three years. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like this, like five two petite little girl. Like, okay, I'm gonna give you a model one day. And so that's kind of what sparked the whole thing. And I went back to him like three or four times over the course of like three years. And the response each time after our initial meeting was just like, "Oh, like I'm sorry, like, we already have girls who kind of look like you," or "Um, oh, I'm sorry, like if you are if you come back to us when you're like five ten, then like maybe we'll consider you." Signing them, like I have no control over my height. Okay, that's not something that I have the ability to change. And so I went from being scouted by Elmer to being scouted by Ford, um, being scouted by a bunch of other agencies, but never actually getting signed. And for a while, it like it beat me down because I was just like, I don't get why somebody would approach me in the first place and give me the hope that I could potentially be a model and then not follow through with the potential in the first place. Um, and so eventually I kind of was just like, you know what, if I'm not going to get signed, then I'm going to find a way to just do this on my own. And the earlier I think you find a way to, like rejection is horrible, and, but you're going to encounter it in all parts of your life. Um, the earlier you find a way to cope with that and move on with it, the easier things will get. And so eventually I was just like, you know what, like, Eventually, social media came into play, things like um, Snapchat and Instagram. Um, and just from the small, like the small fashion shows that I did and the photo shoots that I did, I was able to meet and like network with people. And I was like, you know, if a photographer approaches me and they're reputable and they want to work with me and collaborate, that's what I'm going to do. And it's what I've continued to do is that 
people message me and they say, hey, we like what you're doing, we like the work that you've been doing. Um, would you like to do a photo shoot? Sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's not. That's something that you will have to figure out for yourself and really figure out what your value is. But for me, I love collaboration. I love meeting with a photographer who has a really cool, weird idea. They're not getting paid for the shoot either. I'm not getting paid for the shoot either. But we have this passion for creativity and creating art. Um, and so I think that's kind of where I'm at. And the less I focused on like, oh, I'm not signed, oh, I'm not signed, the more I realized that I was like, you know what, though, I, I, I'm i a model, I'm going, I'm going to embrace that. And even if I'm not signed, I'm still going to collaborate and work with people who want to work with me, you know. Um, obviously, there are benefits to being a signed model, money, <laughs> um, and exposure, right? But I think the harder you work um, at what you love, that will shine through in the end, you know? And also just finding a balance between your passion and what, you're, what you love and learning to take a break. There's nothing wrong with that. I think Instagram, it can be a great thing. Um, and social media is fantastic because it puts you in touch with people, right? It allows you to connect with people all over the world without having to go anywhere, right? And to share and learn about other people's experiences. But constantly being flooded with content about other people's lives can put a hamper on what you're doing and um, oftentimes make you probably feel inadequate in that, oh, I'm not doing enough. Oh, I don't have this many followers. Oh, my the people aren't liking my photos. Oh, I got 336 likes on this photo and I only got 200 in this photo. Why? Like, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. You know what I mean? If you like the photo, post it. Great. If people like the photo, even better, but it's not the end of the world, you know? And use Instagram as a tool to fuel what you're doing, but don't let it consume you, you know? We all have those days where you're like, <laughs> scrolling for that kingdom come, you're like, oh, now. You know, if, you are, if you are a content creator and a YouTuber and a stylist, read through some Vogue for a little bit, get inspired by something, you know? if you are um, a photographer, go like Google other styles of photography, nature photography, landscape photography, you know, take the time out of this to fuel your craft, but then use it for your craft, mm -hmm. right? So. Yeah, yeah um, self-love, um, <laughs> I know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> self-love, okay, so um, for me, self-love was really, really tough. Um, so the thing about me is, um, a lot of people, I was never really, yes, I'm an extrovert, but before I was an introvert, just because I felt like a lot of people judge me. So for those of you guys who don't know, like a lot of the times I have this like bubbly, flamboyant, like personality. So some people take it as like, oh, he's this, he's that, you know, and like, I'll get words like, oh, you're a faggot or you're this and that. And like those comments, they hurt. They hurt. Like for a while, like I was, again, I was kind of suicidal as well, because a lot of people would say these things to me and like, you didn't even know me. You don't know what I'm about. You don't even know my name, but you want to call me faggy. You want to call me this. You want to call me that. You want to say I dress weird, you know? And those comments used to really get to me. And, you know, I used to just, same thing. I used to just sit in my room. I used to just cry sometimes. I used to just never want to go outside. I never used to even want to be people's friends because I thought that I would be judged by how I was, my personality. And then um, eventually along the years, um, I was like, okay, like, you know, like Instagram came out. So I was like, let me just use this platform to really show that I can like dress, dress up and possibly inspire people. Like even at the time when I didn't really have that much friends, I was like, okay, whatever. So I ended up doing that. So I would like find walls like in, in Toronto and just like, I would actually take the pictures myself cause I have like a, a tripod thing. So I would take it myself and I would just find these walls and I would take pictures and then I would post. And um, you know, I wasn't getting obviously the buzz that I was getting now, but like people were like, oh my God, I like this. And I was like, okay, cool. So I kept doing it until like, one day, you know, I started um, like two years ago. Yeah, it was two years ago. And um, I don't know if you guys know Karuchi. Yeah. Yeah, she posted me on her Instagram because I did it. Um, I rep rep cut an outfit of, that she did for Fashion Week and she posted on her Instagram. And that's kind of what sparked. I was like, okay, well, if she noticed it. I'm obviously doing something right, you know? And um, that's when I kind of got the confidence to kind of like, you know, just be myself and kind of like just dress up and do whatever I want because. Regardless, people are going to say what they want to say, you know, but for a long time, I really did struggle with like um, 
being confident in myself and self-love, even up until like 2016, like 2017, I wasn't as confident as I was now because again, people were still judging. And because I'm a YouTuber, like, you know, like a lot of comments that come in, you just like a lot of them, they're like, hey, comments. And then kind of just like, well, what did I even do to you? Like, I don't even, like, we don't even know what I even do. You know, I'm just being myself, right? Um, but again, it's just about the positivity. You get a lot more positivity than you get hate. So as much as you feel like people are not supporting you, you have that one person, always look at that one person who is, because they're looking at you for, you know, that same thing that you were looking for from somebody else. You know what I mean? So as much as you feel like you're an adequate or as much as you feel like you're not enough, there's that one person who thinks you are enough. There's that one person who thinks you are great. There's that one person who thinks you are special. But that's, there's that one person who's counting on me to be like, oh my God, I want this guy to do this concept because he inspires me, you know? So that's pretty much what it is. You just have to really just appreciate yourself and appreciate like what you do. And I know a lot of you guys are in school. You guys all work hard. And honestly, like just keep going because again, like there's somebody out there who's really inspired by what you do, regardless of how you feel, just keep going. There's going to be times where you want to give up, but just remind yourself how far you've gotten keep going you just have to keep going because as much as you keep going you will strive better and better and that is just the advice that i give to everybody because a lot of the times people will do something even when it comes to school like we'll get um into school and then you know we'll do the program for like one year and then we're like oh it's stressful i'm talking about why you got you got far you got really far you got 365 days into the year and i'm pretty sure you did good so continuously keep going and i try to tell everybody that and once the more you keep going you'll actually appreciate yourself and be like whoa like i'm actually doing a good job because sometimes like i'm a person who doesn't i never give myself credit and i think that's where a lot of us go wrong too we just we just always want to keep doing something because we feel like what we do is just never enough but take the time sometimes to really just tell yourself even in the mirror i love myself and listen i give myself credit because today I did four essays. I did this and I did this. I'm bomb. I guess you have to keep telling yourself. You have to keep telling yourself that because if you don't, who, who else is gonna tell you? You know, some people may not even tell you, even though they they see what you're doing is dope. But some people will just never tell you. So you have to tell yourself that. You have to tell yourself that at all costs. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. Self love. Absolutely. So um, I just wanted to add on a little bit that um, I am also a creator. I do I'm a musician, I sing, I write poetry, um, I also make some YouTube content as well. And I have been turned down so many times in my life, so, so, so many times, to the point where I let all of that get to my head and I started to internalize it and believe it. And it was just something that when I went for an audition or I went for a casting or something like that, it was in my head. So. What I would do in front of a mirror wasn't what was being projected in front of like the people judging me because I was believing what was told to me before. Right. And honestly, like just to follow with what you all said, it's all about just finding that love within yourself rather than focusing on what other people have to say about you. And it's like the minute I was able to realize, you know, I need to love myself, I need to realize that I am good and I need to believe in myself, that was when I was able to just do good and do do well, you know. Right. And like the fact that I'm here and I'm able to have this platform right now and bring you guys all here to discuss and have a beautiful conversation like this, um, I'm proud. And you guys should be extremely proud of yourselves. You guys are amazing individuals, and it's just there have been so many times where I just wanted to give up and just stop everything that I was doing. And I just I kind of look back on it and I laugh, and it's like wow, like. Had I had given up, I would never be here and have the chance to experience the opportunities that I'm doing today. So I, I really like resonate with what you all had to say and I appreciate it. So let's give that a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.